Um, we published this paper on C. difficile enteritis. So C. difficile is not something that is limited to the colon. And we had a series of six patients that suffered from C. difficile infections in the small bowel um, during the 2004 to 2006 time period. Now, if we go into the literature, um, there are individual cases of C. difficile enteritis that have been described with mortality rates of approximately 70%. We were fortunate to have none of these individuals die, but um, what we ended up seeing were, were patients who basically who would have come through colectomy surgeries for severe colitis, actually becoming quite ill in the perioperative time period, roughly within a month of the operation. What we have here on this um, uh, coronal reconstruction uh, CT enterograph, we have an individual who has a um, J pouch that has been diverted. Um, here we have the loop ileostomy diversion. So oral contrast is up top, but what we see below here are these fluid-filled loops of bowel. This is really the classic finding that we see in these individuals with high fever and leukocytosis. Um, and again, you have to get the um, antibiotic into this downstream segment of intestine, which sometimes involves injection of vancomycin through the downstream port of the loop ileostomy or rectal administration in order to get these individuals better. So C. difficile is not limited to the colon. It can definitely occur in the small intestine and in patients who have had J-pouch reconstruction. So therapeutic considerations. Um, in hospitalized patients, it's important to obviously isolate individuals and have contact precautions. Um, whenever we would test for C. difficile in the past, it would actually result in the cart outside the room with the barrier and the gloves. And actually, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing because you're actually protecting your patients from people bringing the organism into their room. And in hospital acquisition of C. difficile is an incredibly high risk environment. So that actually may protect your patients from particularly the IBD patients who are so high risk from contracting this while they're involved in a five to seven day stay for severe colitis flare. We would recommend daily stool testing. Um, and I, I, don't, I think I have the dubious distinction of having tested patients up to eight days in a row and actually had a combined, uh, confirmed positive on day eight. That got us our 46th positive uh, uh, patient in that cohort from 2005. Um, so when we have suspicion for this, I wanna know if it's there. 10% of the patients with IBD that we've cared for in the past had a history of C. difficile infection at some point in their lifetime. So this is an ultra high risk group of patients and I wanna know if it's there because the chance of a C. difficile infection coming back is about 50%. Let's us know what we're dealing with. And I also like to have data. I think it's important for us to answer questions. Um, empiric oral vancomycin in the hospitalized cohort um, I think is important for people who have been exposed to antibiotics They've been stable. We don't have a good, clear explanation in terms of why things have been problematic. We have also used intramedous metronidazole in combination with this. And again, there is no uh, good evidence-based medicine to support this other than what I'm describing from a case series here. It's never been explored in the IBD patient population. It's important to maintain oral diet. I alluded to the fact that food coming through the GI tract is a prebiotic. It gives the enteric flora a chance to survive. So if you make your patients NPO, you're giving the anaerobes a growth advantage. So don't do that. It's not the best approach in this setting. And I would recommend decreasing corticosteroid dosing because of what I had mentioned previously. The, the nonspecific effect of high dose intravenous steroids is really probably the worst actor uh, in a patient who's really suffering from this true infection. And um, making the IgG response to toxin A is really critical uh, for these patients to get better. Um, what we have here is a summary head-to-head -head comparison of vancomycin and metronidazole. And the thing I'd like to highlight is that the severely ill patients, the hospitalized individuals, there's really clear evidence that vancomycin is the superior approach. And this is always oral vancomycin. This is going to be um, intravenous vancomycin has no efficacy whatsoever in the treatment of C. diff. So when we think about vancomycin, it is actually the only FDA-approved drug for C. difficile treatment. So when you're starting to get pushed back from insurance carriers, just let them know that this is an FDA-approved drug, and this is something that they have to work with. Um, the major problem has been the, the, we have a single supplier of vancomycin tablets, and there have actually been shortages in production over the past several years. The cost is absolutely horrific. It's about $1,300 for a two-week course of antibiotic. But we actually have an alternative that has been um, quite effective. The intravenous forms of vancomycin can be ingested quite readily. And if you have a hospital-based pharmacy, they can basically uh, provide a two-week supply of vancomycin that patients can drink that will go through the GI tract and have the same efficacy as the pills. And, and most in-hospital uh, formularies will use the parenteral intravenous vancomycin for oral ingestion. 
the cost is, uh, the, the taste of vancomycin is not good. Um, it's about a 15-fold decrease in cost. The palatability of oral vancomycin is not good at all, and patients will cringe in horror when you show them the next syringe that they have to inject in their mouth. Um, so I would recommend a couple things. If you have something like plain old mouthwash, Sepacol mouthwash, it will um, stop them from shuddering. Basically, it'll, it'll kill any taste buds. Um, apple juice also, for what reasons I cannot explain, also improves palatability, and that's what we'll typically do for our patients. And um, the parenteral uh, liquid vancomycin is also what we would use to have enema formulation for patients who have had some of the disconnected, uh, surgically altered segments of bowel that we've been talking about. Or if patients are having a severe ileus, just to get the um, vancomycin into the colon, sometimes the rectal administration is important. We typically give something on the lines of a gram and divided dosages throughout the daytime. So what we've been talking about so far is pretty ominous, but I can tell you there's actually some good information that I can share with you. Um, what we have here is the next year of data. So we became very attuned to watching out for C. difficile based on the rising numbers that we saw coming up to 2005. In 2006, we had an equivalent number of cases that were diagnosed, so we were very vigilant to look for C. difficile in our patients. But what we found that was really, I think, very encouraging is the fact that the in-hospital colectomy rate, the patients who got admitted to the hospital, ultimately failed treatment and went on to colectomy decreased from 45% of the individuals in 04 to 26% uh, in the hospitalized cohort in 05. And we got it down to 3.5%. So if you are looking for this and you find it, you can treat it. And you got to work on this fast. Do not have patients languishing for days doing poorly um, because the faster we can get these patients under control, we can basically get the synergy with the IBD flare that's going to be an, an important component of this process under control as well. So I think you have to treat both aspects. You treat the infection and you treat the IBD flare that comes with it. So preventive strategies, um, there's not a huge amount we can do in this setting. We try to limit exposure to antibiotics. Um, we've definitely shied away from using broad-spectrum antibiotics like ciprofloxacin in our patients as maintenance strategies. I think the empiric use of antibiotics in this day and age is going to basically be, there was never a huge um, data to support that approach, but I think it's going to fall by the wayside because C. difficile has emerged as such a problematic issue. Um, there are certain Probiotics that can be used, Saccharomyces boulardii, the compound Fluorostor, um, is actually has the best data in terms of neutralizing toxin and helping patients who have struggled with uh, C. difficile and recurrent C. difficile. And there's actually good Cochrane analysis that supports the use of this. Um, environmental decontamination does require uh, basically bleach wipes. Um, so that can be recommended for patients who have struggled with repeated infections over time. And uh, something to keep in mind is that the alcohol-based hand gels that are really everywhere in our environment do not kill C. difficile spores. The only way to have hand decontamination is soap and water. It's not going to kill the spore, but it's going to dislodge the spore from the skin. And then lastly, when we're dealing with um, parents of newborns, because C. difficile is a part of the enteric flora and diaper changing is going to be the reality for those individuals, um, we caution them. We actually try to educate them to, to be very careful, have hand washing, um, as opposed to the hand gels and to wash hands uh, prior to uh, food preparation and meals. So C. difficile can be recurrent and refractory in this population. Um, I would mention that there is a subgroup of patients with inflammatory bowel disease who have a congenital immunodeficiency related IBD. It's not the majority of patients, but we will look at a quantitative immunoglobulin level just to make sure that we're not dealing with that individual. And if you ask in the history, you'll get a history of sinusitis infections. You'll get a history of recurrent in bronchitis infections, pneumonias. Um, so basically, these are individuals who have a Crohn's-like process that is linked to uh, immunoglobulin G deficiency. Um, they are incredibly high risk for getting C. difficile, and the only way to get these people better is to um, think about using intravenous immunoglobulin. Now, IVIG rescue strategies have been published, and we will consider this in certain settings, but this is really mandatory for the individuals who have um, this rare form of inflammatory bowel disease. My guess is it's approximately 2% of patients, but if we think about the subgroups that are going to do poorly, this is one of those groups. <clears throat> 